Hey y'all, thanks so much for coming to my talk. I've worked in detection and response for the last decade, and I've made a lot of mistakes, especially when it comes to metrics. This is the talk I wish I'd seen. Today you'll get three things. You'll get a framework I built to help you build much better metrics. You'll get a new maturity model that I've been using to describe and measure detection and response capabilities and you'll get lots of examples. So my story with metrics starts on a Monday morning. I'm only a few months into a new job and I get a message from my boss. He's like, hey, you know, the board of director meeting's coming up and I'm looking for updated program metrics. And you can tell I'm new to senior management. I'm eager to please. I don't ask any questions. So I send a message to my new team and I ask them, hey, what have we presented in the past? <laughs> yes. What's the response? Oh no, bad news. Last manager just made those up. And good news, I'm gonna do so much better. How many of you have had this happen where you inherit someone else's metrics? Yes. This is often our starting place Metrics that haven't been well thought out, or maybe even worse, fudged to avoid questions or more work. Yes. So I did what you probably did. I Googled it. And then I ended up just copying the metrics I used at my last job. And that's led me to using a lot of bad metrics. But so what? Why should we care about metrics? Well, you all attended a talk that had metrics in the title. Why do you care about metrics? It can drive change. It can, it can drive change. It shows, doing it shows you're doing things. What would you say you do here? Budget. Budget. Yeah, I need more money. I need more headcount. Yeah. One reason might be, yeah, metrics do. They, supposed to drive improvement. Uh, Carl Pearson, he's a late 1800s, 1900s guy, widely viewed as the founder of modern statistics. And he's got this quote he's famous for, that which is measured improves. Sounds like a great plug for metrics. But there's an implied warning in that message. What if I'm measuring the wrong thing? There's this paper that's written by these two guys out of MIT Hauser and Katz, and the paper's called Metrics, You Are What You Measure. And they talk about how as you pay more attention to metrics, you start to make decisions and take actions to improve those metrics. The metrics you choose are improving. And over time, you'll become what you measure. Metrics also help us communicate what we do, why people should care. Uh, Edward Tufte, who, by the way, he teaches one of the greatest classes about presenting data. It is not cybersecurity or InfoSec related whatsoever. Uh, he's got an entire section that talks about terrible PowerPoints. So it's a very fun class. And he's got a quote that says, metrics reveal data. Metrics are a tool that enable us to present the greatest number of ideas in the shortest time with the least ink in the smallest space. And why? Well, if we're being honest, because we need budget. We need headcount. And metrics are usually the tool we use to communicate that. So why are security metrics hard? Why do we struggle with security metrics? We don't know what success looks like. We don't know what success looks like. What else? I've heard people say, it's because we're trying to prove a negative, right? Like, nothing happened, success. Uh, in my personal experience, security metrics are hard because I'm a security person. I don't care that much about metrics. Uh, here's a much less famous quote. Metrics are an annoying PowerPoint I need to update every month. That's me. 
A bit about me, I'm a senior staff engineer. I work at Airbnb. I work on fun things like enterprise security, threat detection, and incident response. And I really love my job. I live in Austin, Texas with my wife and three-year-old son, Liam. Here he is, little smile there. And I really love being a dad and a husband. And there's one, one thing I'm really good at as a husband, as a dad, and as a security engineer. I'm really good at making mistakes. And this is the point of the talk where I'm supposed to gain some credibility with all of you, tell you about my accolades, my 15 years of experience, but really, I've just been making mistakes. Let me tell you about five of them. And the first terrible mistake I've made is losing sight of the goal. How many of you are on call or work in alert queue of some kind? Yeah. How many of you are on call right now? Yes. What a terrible idea, right? Those are the tired people in the room, by the way. And uh, This year marks my 10-year anniversary of being on call. And for those of us that spend our days triaging alerts and responding to fires, it can be really easy to lose sight of the goal. And so, we end up describing that frontline operational work with metrics like this one. And here's a metric that shows the number of security alerts per, per month. How many of you have seen this metric before? Yeah, how many of you have this metric today? Cool. And if you take a closer look, you can see in the past year, March and April had the most alerts. My boss will ask a question about that. And if we keep looking at it, it looks generally like alerts are trending down. Did we do that? Did we stop logging something in February? Did I get really mad at the IPS alerts and was just like, we're turning them off? Alert count has become the heartbeat metric for security operations. Instead of rooting back to the goal of detecting threats and responding quickly, we've reduced ourselves to cries for help. I've come to call this metric the operational burden we've inflicted on ourselves. <laughs> You'll notice this graph has no numbers on the y-axis. If it said 5,000 versus 500 versus 5 million, like, does that? Does that mean anything to anybody, especially the people that aren't working the alert queue? Another title for this might be, we're doing things. It's crazy out there. Maybe it's fear-driven, scare leadership with a bunch of alerts. And sometimes we try to make it a bit better. We break it down by true and false positives. I've been proud of myself for doing this, but if I'm honest, I'm not really sure what I was trying to say with this metric, that we have a lot of false positives. So what's a good true to false positive ratio? Is it the same for every alert type? If I reduce this number, would it mean that I have decreased my visibility in the threats? If I have too many false positives, does it mean that I'm possibly missing true positives? And so the first problem I'm running into is, I don't know where to start with metrics. Detection and response has significantly matured as a field, but I'm stuck here making metrics about alert volume. So I needed a starting point. And so to give you a starting point, I thought about what in detection and response could we measure to help us make decisions to see if we're improving? The acronym here is not great, it's SAVER. And the S of it is we want to show that we're streamlining our operations by improving our efficiency and accuracy through automation, through better tooling and processes. So that's one area for metric. We want to raise awareness about what we're learning from threat intel. Share things like what threats and trends we need to be prepared for. We want to measure our vigilance how prepared are we for those top threats? Can we detect them? 
And as we learn about new threats and trends, how is that guiding our threat hunts? As we explore our networks, what are we finding? And when our detections fire or our threat hunts turn into incidents, what's our readiness? How quickly are we able to organize and respond to incidents? How complete are our playbooks? So when you're thinking about your own metrics, think about which saver category the metric should fall under. And this can help you tie it back to an outcome. And I like to start with just one metric in each category. Uh, we often get asked to make a lot of metrics. Um, and that doesn't help us focus. And so for each metric, we should ask, what question does this metric answer? So what question were we trying to answer with this metric? I think it was, are false positives taking up too much of our time? Or phrase it a different way, do I have enough time to properly investigate my true positives? So another important question to ask when you're looking at a metric is, how do I control this metric? How do I reduce false positives? So how do I reduce false positives? Alert tuning. How's that going for you? Yeah, about that. And if I map this to my saver categories, this is maybe a streamlined metric. And streamlined metrics usually answer questions about efficiency, accuracy, and automation. So I have two big problems with this metric. First, this metric doesn't tell us where we're spending most of our time. We think it does. Intuitively, it makes us feel like we're spending most of our time with false positives. And second, the only control I'm rewarding is tuning or turning alerts off. So how can we make it better? And here's a graph of time spent on false positives. And for now, I've completely removed the true positives because for now, I'm OK if we spend time on those. And instead of tracking how many false positives there are, I'm tracking how much time we're spending on them. Now, how do you track this? That could be as simple as well, whatever alert system you're using is when the alert gets created to when it either gets assigned or triaged, and there's an inherent problem with that. Uh, if your team's anything like mine, you know, if I'm on call, I'm doing the triage, and I've got you know, 10 alerts sitting there in the queue, what's the first thing I do when I see all those? Do I go to each one individually and start working on them? No. I select them all and I assign them to myself. And why do I do that? What metric? Time to respond, time to triage, our SLAs. It's important to remember when you're thinking about a metric to remember that you've got a bunch of hackers and they're going to figure out how to make this metric improve regardless of what they're actually doing is improving the, the process. So I recommend not measuring it for a while. You want to have accurate time for how long an alert triage takes. And by measuring something that is inherently making people do the thing that gives you poor data, doesn't make any sense. So how do I control this metric? How do I improve this metric? Well, automation maybe. And as we get more automation tools, the number of events may not even equate to how much time we're spending on false positives. And as you automate, you can carry over the time you spend to automate that. So this lets you do something really cool. You can actually speak to the amount of human hours your automation efforts are saving you. So now, folks aren't just incentivized to tune or turn off alerts. They're incentivized to find out where are we spending the most manual time so that we can automate it. My second mistake. My second mistake is using quantities that lack controls. Or more simply said, measuring the things 
you can't change. Mean time to recover is a classic incident response metric. It'll be in your Google search. And in this example, you'll see that recovery was lower in September and October, and then it grew in November and December. But then the team pulled together. We did some real good process management. We improved our tools. We worked really hard, and we got those recovery times back down. Or maybe there are two, three, four major holidays in November and December. It's funny, I've spent the last year researching metrics for detection and response, and I've learned something. We're obsessed with speed in incident response. The vast majority of results when I search for detection and response metrics are about mean time, time to detect, time to respond, time to contain, time to recover. And I'm not gonna argue that speed isn't important, but using time as the sole measurement across incident phases completely ignores quality and effectiveness. But my big problem with this metric is that security incidents have a lot of variability, especially the further you get downstream in the response process. A lot of dependencies from event start to recovery, and not all of them can be controlled, especially by our teams. So a graph like this, it doesn't help me make decisions because I don't know what's controllable here. I don't know what my team needs to do. I don't even know if this is good or bad. And what happens when your teams don't know how to improve a metric? You stop caring about it because you can't affect it. So instead, I've broken out the response times across all the different phases, and here, I have filtered out any built-in time that I need for quality. So I like to do this where every response playbook I have has some expected built-in time. Sure, as you mature your capabilities, that built-in time will come down, but that's not the focus for this graph. Here we're looking at what can we control today? Eric Branwine from AWS, he gives this talk, it's called the tension between absolutes and ambiguity in security. And in it, he says, when you look at a metric, it should immediately answer, what do you want from me? What do you want me to do? And one of the easiest ways you can do, you, one of the easiest ways to do that is make the answer zero if there's nothing to do. So here I've filtered out all the time we can't reduce right now. So if there's nothing for us to do, We've made the answer zero. So now I can look at these metrics, and I know exactly what it wants from me. Go look at the incident in December and figure it out what happened in the remediation phase. So then we can either filter out more of that time because it needs to be built in, or we can do improvements in our playbooks. My third mistake was thinking proxy metrics are bad, or more simply, choosing amazing metrics that are insanely expensive to create, when all I really needed was a metric that was good enough. So here's a great example. So a long time ago, uh, my team and I decided that we wanted to know what our MITRE ATT&CK coverage was. And this was before this was the cool, sexy thing to do. And we determined that we needed to write tests across the entire framework. And once we got going, we figured out, OK, we don't need just one test per technique. That won't tell us much. And also, we've got Windows, Mac, and Linux, so we're probably going to need a couple of tests for those. And so after years of developing tests, investing in tooling, we finally had the data to visualize our attack detection coverage. Side note, I saw a really great tweet the other day. It said, we need to do a better job of mocking vendors that claim 100% MITRE ATT&CK coverage for lots of reasons. But most importantly, it's silly. I've seen the carnage that 100% MITRE ATT&CK coverage is, and it's alert fatigue like you wouldn't believe. Anyway, we spent years gathering all this data, and it is very cool. But at the end of the day, all we really wanted to know was, where do we prioritize detection building? So do this instead. 
Rather than trying to measure your, det your detection coverage across the entire attack matrix, start by finding the top five threats you care about the most. Don't overthink it. Look at your external threat intel and think about what industry you're working in. What type of environment do you have? And then look at your incident trends. What kind of events, what kind of incidents are reoccurring? And then link those back to your organization's security risks. What would be a really bad day for your company? If data was exfiltrated, what data would make your chief privacy officer cry the most? It's a great metric. You can visualize it by a growing tier as well. And once you've got your top five, prioritize your detection development from there. And I like to workshop these as a team where everyone takes one of the top five threats. And then we use attack to derive all the different techniques and sub-techniques. And as you write tests and detections, you'll slowly end up building yourself this prioritized MITRE attack coverage map, things you actually care about, but without all the alert fatigue and without having to build this super costly metric. And plus, now you might be best friends with your chief privacy officer. My fourth mistake was not adjusting to the altitude. And as someone who has floated back and forth between management and individual contributor, I'm very guilty of this one. Who here has tried to explain all the different columns of the MITRE ATT&CK framework to a board of directors? Yeah, I see a couple guilty hands. I have, sure, why not, let's do it. Detection coverage is actually one of the better new metrics that we've come up with. But wow, we've done a bad job of explaining it at the leadership level. I've seen one of those MITRE ATT&CK heat maps uh, from a specific vendor just slapped into a board of directors deck as if it meant anything to them. So we need metrics at every altitude. And the higher the altitude, the less it becomes about the specifics of detection and response and more about the impact to the business. And it's helpful for me to think about it like a pyramid. For the business, the impact we make is reducing the cost of an incident or a breach. Or another way to think about it might be how costly we make it for an attacker to cause impact. And so our metrics at the top of our pyramid are about mean time to detect and alert the organization about a threat and how quickly we can respond and get, thing, get business back to usual. But then under that top layer is our coverage and effectiveness. Can we detect the top threats to the business? Do we have playbooks for the attacks most likely to happen? Do we have the visibility we need? And then under that layer, how well do our tools perform? How much time do we spend trying to figure out what logs we need to search and how long it takes to search them? Organizing your metrics in a pyramid can help you connect the lowest layers to your North Star metric and speak at the altitude that's appropriate for your audience. Organizing them in a pyramid can also help you connect your metrics to the rest of the security organization. So it turns out detection and response isn't always the best strategy. If your metrics show that mean time to respond is trending up because of a repeating type of incident, Sometimes the best way to reduce the cost isn't by improving your streamlined or your readiness metrics. It's putting a new control in place to prevent that type of incident from even occurring. I really like to do this, especially because I get to work across lots of different teams. I get to work across detection and response, and then I get to go and visit all the teams that do prevention. And you would be surprised how little we're telling those other teams. They have no clue what's happening over in detection and response. They don't know what prevention and controls they should be prioritizing based on what's happening in the real world. And it's our job to help inform them so that our lives get a lot better. And my last mistake was asking why instead of how. And my natural inclination is to ask why. 
Why didn't we detect that malware sooner? Why are we still missing those firewall logs? And as a dad, I have a lot of why questions. Why do we bring the car seat when we only took one taxi ride the entire trip? Why do we need four suitcases? Why didn't we bring the stroller? And why can't Liam walk by himself? Why can't you walk by yourself, Liam? <laughs> but in all of these examples, why is not helping. And so instead, I've learned to move straight to the how and start figuring out what needs to be done. And often, answering how allows you to identify the underlying problem much faster and from a much more positive perspective, especially from your spouse. I mean, coworker. How can I carry Liam a car seat and two suitcases through the airport? How can we detect these types of threats sooner? How can we respond faster? When I interviewed with my current VP, she asked me, how do we build a modern detection and response program? How do we get there? But one question interview. And it made me think about maturity models. And my first exposure to maturity models was the hunting maturity model, HMM. Who here is not familiar with the hunting maturity model? OK. So it came out in 2015-ish. It was created by David Bianco, who's also the creator of the Pyramid of Pain. And HMM was great when it came out. And it's still great today, because it helps describe the different levels of maturity for a threat hunting program. What do we need to get to the next level of maturity? How do I get there? What specific indicators would put me there? What type of activities would be expected at different levels of maturity? And maturity models are useful from a standpoint that they give us as security practitioners this common language to answer where we are now, where we're going, and how we're going to get there. So I created the threat detection and response maturity model. And the TDR maturity model builds off of the hunting maturity model and expands it across all the different areas of detection and response. And there's a lot to it. So at the end, I'll provide a link with the full maturity model that you can use. And the first pillar I thought about was when measuring maturity was observability. Do I have the tools and logs to get the visibility into our entities and user activities? Can I enrich it so it's contextualized and searched quickly? And then proactive threat detection, where we focus on collecting threat intel, prioritizing the detections we build and buy, and the hunts we perform. And then finally, rapid response, where we prepare playbooks and automations so we can move from triage to analysis and respond with all the forensic capabilities we need. And we can use these pillars and these 14 capabilities to describe and measure where we are today and where we want to go next. And for each of the 14 capabilities in the framework, you'll score four different areas, process, tools, documentation, and testing. And you'll rate those from initial all the way up to leading. And I've provided some general guidance on how to rate the maturity of each area. But in the framework itself, there's a lot more specific direction for each specific category and capability. So for example, if we rate our detection engine capability, we think about what processes do we have? Do I have a process for creating a detection that looks for first time occurrences? Do I have a process that defines the most optimal way to determine those thresholds? And then we rate our tools. Are the detections we have managed from a central location? And then documentation. Or what's been the case for most of my career, the lack thereof. And then finally, there's testing. And we all know what happens when you don't test things well. Bad stuff happens. And as you go through each of the capabilities and rate them, I like to rate them individually. And then afterward, rate them together with your team. Because everyone, once you start talking about the different capabilities, you'll hear things that you'll go change your mind, confirm your own rating, and you can have a really great discussion about where you are with each capability. And then you can take those ratings and show at a high level where you are today across the three pillars. 
And where you plan to be by, say, the end of the year, based on the projects you're planning and the initiatives you're doing. And I like to use this tool because it's a very simple message for leadership, but there's a lot of underlying detail that backs it up that you can zoom into depending on your audience. But I also really like to use it because it shows whether the work that you've planned is going to have impact or not. If you've done all your planning projects and you're like, cool, I'm gonna work on this, and then you're projected to not move at all, maybe you should rethink the things you're prioritizing. What's also really cool is that a number of companies and folks have been starting to use this. And I can now start to baseline where different sectors are and understand where I should expect myself to be and where folks have struggled in moving their maturity. And this is the nice thing about using a framework is that we're talking about the same capabilities and problems using a common language and we could talk specifically about what went well and what didn't in our journey to get there. So as you do this work, you'll need metrics to show, are you getting better? And here's where Saver comes back in. And so for each metric you create, you'll put it into this structure. You want to avoid my first mistake, losing sight of the goal, and ask, what question does this metric answer? What's the outcome we're looking to achieve? And then what Saver category do I tie it back to to help drive that outcome? You want to avoid my second mistake, using quantities that lack controls. Make sure it's a metric you can actually control. And don't forget, make it zero. Filter out what you can't control today, so when you look at a metric, you know exactly what it's telling you to do. And then, if you have control of a metric, what risks could this measurement reward? I was talking to a buddy of mine, and he runs one of those really big socks, like the kind with the huge room and the monitors on the wall and the pew pew map. And I haven't been in a big operational sock in a really long time, and I'm happy to say pew pew map is alive and well. It's doing well. Anyway, they were talking about metrics, and he was telling me that their time to analyze metric was one of the biggest pain points in this sock overall analysis was way above what they expected. So they brought the metric up to the team. They're like, hey, time to analyze. We got to find ways to bring it down. So guess what? You won't believe it. The team brought it down. And guess what else went down? Quality of analysis. So then guess what went up? True positives missed. So when you introduce a new metric, Think about, hmm, what risky behavior am I rewarding? It might not be a bad metric, but you might want to create metrics that balance it out. Because remember, you become what you measure. Then there's metric expiration. When is this metric not needed anymore? When my only lever was alert tuning, it might have made more sense for me to track alert volume. But now, as I automate more and more of my alerts, maybe it's time I expire the alert count metrics or at least remove it from my leadership decks. And then data requirements. How much data will this metric require? How much new effort are we going to need to improve this metric? And how much time does it take to collect this metric? Don't come away from this talk telling people, Alan said I should spend all my time working on metrics. That's not the reality. The reality is that we rarely have enough time to work on metrics. So don't make my mistake number three, where you come up with this amazing metric that's going to take so much time to work on to improve. Think about the fact that I have very little time. I don't get new headcount just because I invented a metric. Take that into account when you're choosing your metrics. And anytime I talk about metrics, I always get asked, how do I change the bad metrics I'm already presenting. And I get it. Change is hard. Leadership does not like surprises. And they often have expectations that I'll be updating last month's slide deck. But I have a tip that's worked really well for me. Uh, here I've convinced my friend Dexter, he's still my friend, to get in near freezing water. It's about a little under 40 Fahrenheit. And Dexter's first reaction was shock. His heart rate spiked. 
When his body hit the water, he gasped. Liam thought this was pretty funny. And he had to work to not hyperventilate. But then suddenly, it all made sense to him. This is great. And it's the same when you change your metrics. It's not gonna be fun immediately. People will go into a state of shock. Those metrics, they've been around a while and they've gotten very, very used to them. But my tip is embrace it. Push through the change, because they'll soon have clarity. Because when you bring it all together, you're about to tell a story that's complicated, it's technical, and you don't have a lot of time to tell it. So here's my pitch. Up front and center is our maturity model using the TDR maturity model, and it shows the maturity of the program, where we are today and where we're targeting by the end of the year. And then we use the saver categories to tell the rest of the story. We're streamlining our operations by looking at what's taking the most time. That's what we're automating. We looked at our threat intel and incident trends, and we're raising awareness about these top five threats to the company. We're focusing our time this quarter to build detections for these threats. Here's where we're tracking. And we've been exploring gaps in security controls relevant to those top five threats, and we found three new gaps. And from a readiness perspective, we have one type of reoccurring incident with a really long recovery time, so we're working with our security team to implement new controls that'll prevent these from ever occurring. So now, instead of making wild guesses about whether you're improving and if the tools you're buying are making a difference, you can use the TDR maturity model to measure your capabilities. Instead of using volume counts, fear tactics, and tired emojis, you can use Saver to get to the core of a metric, ask better questions, and map that to something you can control. And instead of focusing on 100% MITRE attack coverage, you're focused on the threats that matter the most, found your top five, and are working on having detection coverage with real impact. So hopefully this talk is your wake-up call. Take a cold plunge. It's time to rethink your detection and response metrics. Thank you very much. And this is my link tree. It has my contact info. It has a copy of the slide deck. And then there's the complete TDR maturity model. I also write a very infrequent newsletter, very infrequent, uh, I have a toddler, called Meowward. Uh, it has an adorable cat that people love. The security info is half decent. I've got lots of stickers to hand out. So please, if you see me after, please come and grab them. And I think we have a couple minutes for questions. We've got a couple minutes for questions, so raise your hand and I'll walk around on the mic. Thank you so much for this, by the way. I thought this was really useful. I had a question regarding the program maturity model that you were talking about. Can you talk a little bit about what you use to fill out that graph? I'd, I'd like to understand that better to have examples. Yeah, absolutely. I gave a talk last year about building a modern detection and response program. And in that talk, I dived, I took a step back and I dove into what are all the things that we do in detection response. And then I thought about what are those outputs? And what I found was a lot of the outputs that we had internally, things like threat intel, were really not getting shared at the right level. They were, you know, informing our other tools internally. And that was about it. Um, there's a link in this link tree that has that full talk. And in there, I talk about all the different areas of detection and response I think we need to be able to succeed. And I use a lot of, uh, a lot of additional like, research that folks have done into how do we build good programs? How do we think about programs and what matters the most? So check that out. That'll answer a lot of questions for you. Yeah, great talk. Um, two questions. How long does it take for a big sock with those pew pew maps to get this going? All right. How long does it take? All right. Well, it, I guess it depends on like your bravery. Uh, I have had folks I've talked to that are like, this is going to take me years to make that change. Um, it really does depend on your leadership's willingness to shift. I really think that if you're not telling the story of what you're doing, 
all you're really doing is continuing a narrative that doesn't inform anything. One thing I found works really well is asking back the question of what question are you trying to answer with the metrics we have today? And spending that time to bridge that gap. Because a lot of times the questions they have in their head don't, aren't really actually being answered by the metrics we're putting in front of them. And you can use that Saber framework to find where their question really is and map it to something you can really show that, that makes that change. I'll come back to you for your second question later. Um, how do you guys go from counts of detections in a MITRE bucket, say, to coverage of that MITRE bucket? S say that again? Uh, so we talk, there was a MITRE coverage, you know, kind of in there for like a, a, a tactic or procedure. How do you go uh, from the counts of the detections that you have to deciding how much of that is coverage? Within coverage, it's really tricky to know, and this is, this is partly why uh, I think a lot of the MITRE attack coverage maps that specific vendors and tools pump out don't tell us a lot, especially if we don't understand, like, you know, a MITRE attack technique could have 50 different kind of examples. And if you could detect one of those, does it really inform that you'd be able to detect that in a day-to-day -day way? Um, there's uh, a weighting system that I've used in the past where for every test you write and every then correlating detections to those tests, you talk about how good that test is for how good the detection is. So if you can think of 50 different ways to do something, will your detection catch a percentage of those? This is what I think helps us build detections that are a lot better versus like if somebody's like, oh, I'm going to detect all MITRE attack, you could write like some very simple binary type detections. Or you can improve your like, all right, this is looking at behavior that doesn't normally happen here. And it's extracting out some sort of data analysis from that. I think having a maturity of basic all the way up to, you know, this is actually going to detect a lot of different like abnormal behavior will help you weight whether or not you say what percentage of that technique you're covering. And so assigning like a weight to each of those. There's a really great talk, I'll have to look it up, that they talk about a framework for weighting the tests that you have for each MITRE technique to the weight of your detection. And they've done like a really cool analysis of like tools that actually like do this. Uh, so come find me, I'll try to find that talk, uh, that paper. I think one more. So if you're just starting out with some of this, what would be the top things that you prioritize first? From like the metrics I create? Yeah. All right, I would start with what you're doing today. Uh, so if you don't have a threat intel program or you're not even thinking about threat intel today, don't start with that metric because you've got to do a bunch of work first. Um, I, I, I really think you generally don't have a lot of time for metrics. So think about what can I actually measure today that would help me make better decisions today. Uh, if I think about like the S A V E R, I like to start kind of on the the response readiness side of things because that's the stuff that happens regardless. Uh, you have an incident, you could have created the detection for that, but the reality of it is is like you just might need to be able to respond to those things. And so I like to start from response, I think that's uh, the readiness area. I think that's a good place to start. Cool, I'm out of time. I'll hang out in the hall over there and I've got lots of stickers. So thanks everyone for attending. <laughs>